and I remember sitting in the doctor's surgery and, and just breaking down completely. The, the, I don't know whether that was relief because someone had finally found something that why I wasn't right or whether it was um, because I was then thinking how can I how can I have this illness? How can I, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty level-headed, I go through processes, I do all that sort of thing, how can I have an issue of mental illness? What I've tried to do is get around to as many stations as I can to talk to people about what mental illness is, a little bit about my story, some inspiration that I had to help me get out, and then where you can actually get help uh, if you need it. So the idea of the ride of Don't Do It Alone come about because basically when you're in a position that I was in, you can't do it by yourself. You need help. Um, you need your help with your friends, your family. You need, if you need professional help, that's, that's there. If you need medication, that's also another form of help. But you need to have people with you. So that was the idea. The, the idea of the bike was um, so that people could ride with me, as we've got today. And I think there's only been one day that I haven't had someone ride with me uh, at any stage, you know, and, that, and I reckon that's really good. So I want to talk a little bit about mental illness. Now, um, mental illness, I've just got a few stats up here on the board, but, and I just wanted to show you that it's not an isolated incident. So in Australia, there's been research done that's about a million people being diagnosed at the moment with being treated for depression, and there's about two million people being treated for anxiety. So you can see three million people out of the Australian population is a fair whack of our, um, a fair percentage of our population. The one, the stat that gets me is down the bottom here where six Australians die by suicide every day. You know, and when you look at the road toll and how much work we put into the road, reducing the road toll, and this figures double, or a bit more than double what the road toll is. So, you know, it's um, it's a pretty big area that we that we need to look at. I was nearly one of them. I, uh, I'll talk about that later on, but I was nearly one of those stats at multiple times. So, you know, and and I look at um, from a, a even a volunteer's perspective, when a volunteer joins. We sign up a member's form, we sign up the police check, we teach them minimum skills and off they go. We don't teach any, any resilience or anything like that around mental illness. So it's an area where we need to improve and that's part of the, the ride too. I wanna, I'm looking at finding areas where we can improve to help people um, look after their mental health. So if one in 30 people all, will also incur, have experience with PTSD, so you look at the shift here, you've got three guys on, three or four, when you, when you go to four. Um, you times that by your five shifts. You know, you, you really got, you're nearly up there already into the 30. So some people are, may be affected by somewhere along the line that you might know that you work with, the station next door, whatever it is. But say one in 30 will do that. By 2020, mental illness is going to be the biggest illness in the world. So it'll overtake all your cancers and all your your other illnesses around and will be the biggest illness in the world. So again, from, from our perspective, we really need to work on it. We've already put ourselves in a high risk area. You know, we need to work out ways of, of reducing the impact that it can have on us. So this is a bit of the idea about the ride. Mental illness can be a number of different things. It doesn't have to be all of these, it can be one of them. But what you, what you might find is grief is a normal emotion. You know, grief and even anxiety, everyone gets but butterflies in their stomachs from time to time. That's a normal emotion. But when it's prolonged and when it takes control of your life, that's when it starts to become a mental illness. Mental illness is treatable. That's um, one of the really big things that we've got to realise, that mental illness is treatable. If I was playing footy and I wrecked my knee and I need to go and have a knee reco, I go and do it, I'm back, there's no issue there. Same sort of thing. Mental illness is treatable, whether it's by uh, medication, whether it's by uh, consultation, those sort of things, it is treatable. So um, there shouldn't be the stigma behind it that, we ha that, that is out there in the community. There shouldn't be the stigma behind it. We should just be able to say, yes, this is okay. Oh, don't be ashamed. And I think that's the stigma that was maybe even only five or six years ago, I reckon. Uh, and that's what this ride's brought out. It's, it's not, it's not um, 
something to be ashamed of. You've got to deal with it and, and everyone goes through different periods in their life. Just get it out there, feel, talk to someone who you're comfortable to talk with. Find that person who you can um, lend your an ear and say, hey, I do need help. You, you need to talk to someone. You can't, obviously the bike ride was don't do it alone, but you obviously need to talk to someone about it because when you don't, you're actually bottling it up more inside and you're actually eating away at yourself. Um, that's what I found anyway. So by getting stuff, starting to talk about things and getting things out of the way, you know, you can sort of see, yes, there is a process that you can use to get better. I wore every one of these badges when I uh, hit rock bottom, which is about two and a half to three years ago now. I'm so, sort of somewhere about there. Um, I was ashamed of myself. Um, I didn't think I was any good at what I did. I didn't, wasn't worthy of being a person. I just hated myself, all that sort of stuff. So, like I said, it doesn't have to be one. It can be a number, um, but the idea is, is just to be aware that some of the feelings like stress and those sort of things are normal feelings. So just because you're stressed doesn't mean you've got mental illness. Mental illness is a, a clinically diagnosed uh, illness, so the doctors can diagnose it. Um, but yeah, it doesn't mean just because you're feeling a little stressed so don't think after this talk you go, oh geez, I'm a bit down, I'm a bit stressed, and then all of a sudden you think you've got mental illness and the cycle continues, but uh, don't, don't think that, you know, look at the positives of things. So I want to talk a little bit about my story. And the reason I do this is because I don't want sympathy. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to show people that you can be at rock bottom, but you can still come out the other side. You know, I'm, I'm still getting treated um, still on antidepressants and all that sort of stuff, but you can come out the other side from being right down the, the bottom. And I don't want people to get to that point that I was at. So this is the idea of the ride. A little, I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of background about myself. I started in a country town called Melton. Um, we moved here when I was two, and I can still remember dirt roads on Barry's Road, which is only the, the next one parallel to this. And uh, it was a, a great little community to grow up in. I couldn't have asked for anything more. Then, um, so I went to uni, got a Bachelor of Business in Accounting. There's a few uni guys here today, which is great. Um, but got out of accounting and, and got into IT, and then moved out of IT and joined the fire service in 2003. So uh, got posted down to Carrio, and um, I moved down to, to Clifton Springs. Part of the reason I moved to Clifton Springs was the fact that my anxiety levels were too high in Melton. My anxiety, looking back at it now, um, started a lot earlier than I realised. When I was a kid, I never wagged school, I never graffitied, I never shoplifted, I never did any of that sort of stuff because I was always too worried if something was going to happen. So, you know, I look at that now and I think, that was early signs that I was having issues with anxiety. I'm a massive worrier and I worry about the what-if situation all the time. Even at work, if I was going to an alarm at the hospital and I reset the alarm because we can't find anything wrong, my worry would be so much when I come back that what happens if I missed it? All that sort of stuff. And I couldn't, so I couldn't relax. I couldn't relax at work. And that was because I wasn't quite right. I, didn't, I couldn't let people get too close to me. I didn't want to have too many friends that knew who I was because I thought I wasn't a good human being. I was ashamed of myself. Um, you know, I was pretty cut up on all those sort of things. So I moved to Clifton Springs and um, didn't really keep in contact with anyone really from Melton. You'd probably know that from, you know, I think I come back for the 75th dinner here. Um, but other than that, people that I played footy with, played cricket with, you know, fire brigade stuff, I really didn't really keep in contact with anyone. And that was deliberate. That was deliberate. That was me pushing people away. But the same thing happened. My anxiety levels were getting so bad, again, that I couldn't, couldn't stay in Drysdale. So I looked at um, the local, sorry, the CFA internal people moves, and I thought, where's a spot that I can go that I don't know anyone? Wodonga was on the map, there was a leading fire, his job going there, and I thought, yeah, that's pretty far, far enough away. You know, I reckon I can get up there and just be by myself. 
I then thought I'd better tell my wife that I was going to move to Wodonga. So Kylie had no idea at that point. So I moved up there and again, pushed people away. Didn't need people. Thought if I don't make any friends, I'm happy. I could just be a loner. So then I, um, again, and then even when I was at home, I wouldn't answer the telephone. I still don't a lot of the time. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I even got to the point where I couldn't go outside. Uh, my depression was starting to kick in, and I got, and I, I just couldn't function. So I used to walk to the fridge, walk back to the couch, back to the fridge, back to the couch, and I put on about thirty odd kilos in that time. And what I did was I even got to the point where. I couldn't deal with people that I'd actually sit inside and when I heard a car door close, I'd open up the Venetians and if it was for me, I'd turn the tally off and lock the door and go and hide in the bedroom because I didn't want people around. It was pretty easy because Kylie and, and the boys were at school and at work, so no one knew what was going on. So I could still push people away. That time too, I was, I, I was self-harming a lot during this period. I'd go to bed before my wife and I would absolutely belt the shit out of myself, trying to get something to burst or break. And that's not a, a, a real easy thing to do, to hit yourself as hard as you can and keep going and keep going. Um, my wife didn't know about it, and it wasn't until I started these talks that, she, that some of this stuff actually came out and that she realised what was actually happening. So I was working at Wodonga and, and, and things weren't going so well. Um, I was having a few issues there, and I'm ready to pack up and move away again. Um, but I did it once. I don't reckon I could try it again the second time without telling Kylie. So, so I still live there. Um, not that I didn't want to, but um, so during that time, you know, the depression was kicking in. I had some incidents at work where um, a, a guy, a fiery, fell through a roof and uh, threw a skylight, and he caught himself at about this point before he finished all the way through and a couple of guys grabbed him on the BA. And um, there was a cellar underneath and if he'd fallen through, he would have fallen straight through to the cellar and I don't know what the result would have been but I'm pretty sure I know what it, what it should have been. Um, he told me probably a couple of weeks earlier that he was expecting their first bub, him and his wife. And that got me because how was I going to go and tell them that I'd put, I made the decision to put that guy on the roof. So I thought, you know, I've killed, if, if it happened, I killed him. When you're in that cycle, it's really hard to look at any positives. You know, was it positive that he caught himself? Yeah, it probably was. You know, well, sorry it was, but I couldn't see, you know, I, it was all my fault, it was all against me, I was, I was done. Yeah, I tried lots of different ways to talk to him and to get him to talk to me about it and yeah. Yeah, it was really hard and then it came to that really crisis point. I couldn't reach him, you know, he, he was in a dark place. And so the depression was kicking in. Um, I was suicidal. I'd worked out how, when, where. Um, worked out multiple ways. Worked out that if I did it at work, it would be more beneficial for my family financially. It got really, really bad and it's kind of like, you know, is, is he going to get better? And I've, I felt at one stage I was going to lose, you know, my little brother, which is, a, which is, you know, pretty tough. So I was still playing sport at the time and we're playing soccer. And when I say playing sport, I was turning up and playing. I wasn't doing much else. I wasn't socialising, doing all that sort of stuff, which I used to do. So um, playing soccer and I got given a yellow card, which is not a big deal. The yellow card's a, a warning. Um, I didn't, get, I didn't get the yellow card for cleaning the bloke up. I got yellow carded for kicking the ball from here to the doorway, because that's dissent. So I went, but what happened is I um, walked off the ground. Just walked off the ground. So all the spectators in the club rooms are over this side of the, the ground. I walked as far away as I could the other side, sat, behind, sat down behind the tree and cried. And I can still remember some smart aleck kids from Wodonga drive, riding past on their bikes having a crack. You know, here's this bloke sitting behind a tree ball and his eyes out sort of thing. Um, after the game, the boys come and got me and I went home and I spent the next three to four days, I can't quite remember, 
in bed, no human contact, lights, clo lights off, curtains closed, door closed, not talking to anyone, not even the only time I got out of bed was to go to the toilet and that was the ensuite. So, you know, I didn't have to go real far. So I got to a point that um, my wife actually uh, took me to my psychiatrist that I was seeing at the time. I don't know why I went. I, I just, I don't know, just went along with it, I think. I don't think I had any else, anything else to give. When I got hospitalised um, down in Wangaratta, with uh, down, at, down at Kerford there, which is a psychiatric hospital, I guess you'd call it. And I spent a bit of time in there and I got uh, a weekend release. And um, when I got weekend release, they had, uh, had about a gastro go through. And they rang up on the, the Monday and I must have spoke to Kylie and they said, oh, we've got a bit of gastro, we don't really want Terry to come back into this, you know, if you, you've got it. So obviously they thought I'd already had the shits enough and they didn't want to give me any more. So, um... <laughs> So the psych said, yeah, no worries, and, and I stayed out and I started to rebuild. Took my life back to basics. Took it back to basics. Friends, family, and me. Because I'd pushed so many people away, I didn't have many friends, so I had to work pretty hard at it. Because I put up the walls and all of a sudden I've got a dint in my, arm, in my armour and, you know, I was a bit ashamed and all that sort of stuff, but I started to rebuild. Bought a, an old Valiant to pull apart, which turned into four, which turned into a block of land to put the Valiants on. And needless to say, I'm getting pretty good at grinding because my welding's very ordinary. So, um, so look, started to, started to look at things. And, and there's a guy called um, John Wooden, who's a basketball coach, or was a basketball coach in America. And he made life really seem so simple. Life was so simple. And he made a, 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 he's got a heap of quotes and I've actually read a couple of his books which is pretty amazing for me to actually sit down and read anything. But he said one thing that stuck with me is make every day your masterpiece. Do something every day that makes you happy. Do something every day that you can go to bed and say, geez, I've had a good day and I'm proud of myself. I couldn't do that. I couldn't do it. My head was going to thinking of all the bad things and then I was in that mode where I couldn't get out, you know, and everything was bad, everything that happened was bad. So do something that you like to do every day. Um, whether it's talk to your kids, whether it's go Pokemon going with them, I don't know, but just um, whatever it is, as long as you, you can do something every day that, that, that you work for. His dad gave him a seven point creed and I only, but I only grabbed a few of these for myself. Um, one is be true to yourself, make every day a masterpiece, help others, and I've grabbed uh, my make friendship a fine art. To read deeply from good books, I don't read very often, so um, I, I still had textbooks that were in their wrappers when I left uni. So, um, <laughs> um, but make friendship a fine art. I pushed all my friends away. I pushed everyone away. I didn't need friends. I could do things myself. I was pretty good. You know, I didn't need to to talk to people, I didn't need to do anything. Sometimes that friend is the person that you need the most. You know, sometimes it's the, uh, the are you okay question that they might ask you. Sometimes it's just sitting there listening to what you got to say. But because I didn't have any of those outlets, I, I struggled. I had acquaintances at work, yeah, no worries, not a problem. I'd come and I'd talk to work and I'd do work stuff, but no one, you know, I wouldn't get deeply into things or do anything like that. So that's been a really big one for me. Helping others, well, I've always tried to do that and I've actually started getting back into coaching cricket, captaining cricket, on the junior committee, coordinator for the cricket, you know, doing stuff with the soccer, all that sort of stuff, you know, and the white ribbon ambassador thing. So I'm starting to, to give a little bit back again. Be true to yourself. If you give something the best shot you can give, you can't ask any more. You can't ask any more yourself. And, and to me, that's been really good for me lately, you know, because I know that I'm, if I give something a crack, well, I've given it a good go. Success is a peace of mind. I've, I've, even if I just grab those first one, two, three, four, five, five words. When I, was in a, when I was going through uni, I wanted to be an accountant because they had the flashy cars, they had the holiday houses, they had all that sort of stuff. That was success to me. 
that's what I thought success was. Now, because I've had to reassess a few things, doesn't matter. You know, doesn't matter, doesn't bother me. You know, it's more the stuff that um, spending time with my family when we go up to the block, you know, we, we got power up there, but we don't use power at all. And sitting around a fire, doing that sort of stuff, to me, that's more success to me. So work out what your, your successes are and um, just remember that it is a peace of mind. So I started to, started to work on a few things and with the inspiration side of it, I needed a lot of inspiration. So regardless of where I got it, regardless of where I got the inspiration from, whether it was a book, whether it was a movie, whether it was TV, whether it was just riding a bike and seeing how many good people there are in this organisation, it's been amazing. One of, the, one of the things, and, and I'm a, a bit of a music person, but I like, you know, Midnight Oil and ACDC and Violent Femmes and all that sort of music. But there's a song, at the, there's a song going around by Katy Perry called Raw, and she sings about getting held down, getting back up and becoming a champion. And it hits me. It just hits me. I've got it on my phone and my, my iTunes of the um, playlist on Spotify. And the other day I was riding up near Owen somewhere, or the other week, the other week. And um, I was riding along and this song's come on the radio. So I've got the headphones in and I'm taking, so I've taken the GoPro camera off the front of the bike and I'm doing a selfie as I'm riding. And I am belting out this song like there's no tomorrow. Seen it all, seen it now. Get the fire. Because I am a champion. And Absolutely just flying. And I'm just on top of the world thinking, how good is this? I'm in the middle of the bush. I'm by myself and I'm, and I'm cruising around. I haven't replayed it yet. Um, I don't know if I want to. Um, I haven't, I haven't put anyone else through it yet either. So, um, but we'll see how that goes. But again, it was inspiration that grabbed me. You know, so any piece where you can get it, any piece where you can grab any sort of inspiration and you use it and you can use it for yourself to make it better, use it, grab it, do what you can. Brigade, attention! Um, that sort of leads into a bit of the help situation. Um, I, I pressed a button to start going to see Beyond Blue or use their website, but Kylie pressed the button to help, actually help me out and get to the stage where I am now. I had, um, where was I? So with the inspiration again, it doesn't matter where you get the help from. It's, sorry, it's the same as help. It doesn't matter where you get the help from as long as you get it when you need it. So if you think, you know, it doesn't mean pressing the help button means you've got to go to a psych and you've got to go and do all this sort of stuff. <coughs> it could be as easy as sitting next to your mate saying, geez, I'm struggling a bit, or geez, I'm not going too good. What do you reckon? And just having that chat. That's still help. It's still there for you. And that's where I've had to work on my friendships again because... I didn't have those friendships to, to have those help. I didn't have the family behind me to do it because no one knew what was going on. So, um, so yeah, so I got some help. I'm still going. Uh, if I'm on any depress I'm still on antidepressants. And if I have to be for the rest of my life, I don't care because it's given me a life that I didn't have. It's given me uh, a chance to be with the kids, still be a husband, you know. Gives me a bit of a shot to ride around on a bike and and do something. When I was, obviously I must have forgot, I took my antidepressants one morning and then took another lot and that's when I thought I could ride around the state. But, um, <laughs> but, but no, it's, it's, it's actually worked all right. Um, so there's, there's probably four key messages that I really want to get across. The first one is to look after yourself. You are too important. You're too important to your family, to your friends, to everyone that needs you and everyone that wants you and loves you in your, in your life. You're far too important. The second one is to look after your mate. Look after your mate, whether it's your next door neighbour, whether it's your son, your daughter, shift mate, whatever it is, 
look after, look after who you got because, again, they're, they're just far too important. That question of are you okay, it's a pretty easy question. Sometimes we're a bit reluctant to ask it. Nine times out of ten, we'll probably get the same answer, yeah, I'm all good. But the time when you say, no, nah, maybe I'm not travelling too hot, you've made a difference by just asking the question. You know, so because someone's sought the help that they needed to start with. The next one I call is, is um, press the button. Press the big red help button. The earlier you press it, the better it'll be for yourself, the easier it is for yourself. But Kylie pressed that button for me, and I, can't, I, and I can say that that's been the best decision that's ever been made in my life. Because if that didn't happen, I wouldn't be standing in front of you right now. So I've got a bit to thank, I guess. See how we go. Um, real, uh, actually, I probably should say getting married was the best decision that I made. <laughs> but um, to Kylie, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Uh, whew, I, I can get away with that one now. Um, <laughs> but so press that button for help. Like I said, whether it's your friend, whether it is you have to go and see a doctor, whatever it is, as long as you can get that help when you need it. And the last one I'm going to say is it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to not be okay. Mental illness is an illness. It can be treated. If you needed a knee reconstruction... You'd go to the doctors, you get the knee reco done, you'd be back on your way to rebuilding yourself. Exactly the same thing. It's an illness. Get the help, work on yourself, and come back. Regardless of rank, where you come from, which brigade you're at, if you talk about it and get it out in the open, it's going to help. Oh, it's been amazing. Yeah, I feel like I've got, yeah, like my husband back and yeah, I feel like, yeah, we're in a much happier, uh, better space and um, yeah, the, he's way more open and um, honest with, yep, how he's feeling and what he's going through and stuff. So, yep, that's, that's amazing, yeah. I'd like to say that life and your life is far too important. You need to look after yourself and to look after your family and your friends and to be able to press that button when you need to get help. And the bottom line, I guess, it is, is that it is okay to not be okay. You know, we need to look after ourselves and we need to work together to, to achieve that because we are too important in this world.